Okay, we're going to talk about the business now. Production, distribution, exhibition. So making the film, sending it out, and showing it in theaters, particularly. Uh, these days, when things are digital, uh, we haven't really talked about that, but in, in the old days, uh, films were shot on film. Um, very much like the early film developed by George Eastman and uh, the Eastman Kodak and Thomas Edison um, with, the, with the sprocket holes on the sides um, and it was considered the highest quality way to capture images in a funny way, you know, analog, sort of like um, vinyl records. Um, but uh, these days, all studios, all films, all theaters um, make and show films digitally with digital cameras, digital projectors. It costs theaters 100000 each for these projectors. But one of the improvements it makes is that uh, the physical size of the actual film is much smaller, it's tiny. It can be even compressed and sent by the internet. It can be mailed uh, as a little drive. And so it's much cheaper uh, to distribute digital films than, than films made on film. Um, well, as it says here, also 700 and 800 feature length films produced annually in the United States. As you can see, 43,000 movie screens. In the U.S., the three largest theater chains sell nearly 80% of all tickets. AMC is, I think, the biggest. Concession sales count for 40% of a theater's profits. That's important. So that overpriced popcorn and Hawaiian punch and milk duds and Twizzlers, um, you can see they count for a lot of the money that is made. So don't go smuggling a, a bag of smart food popcorn in there and cheating those poor theaters. So here are the major studios still. Uh, Warner Brothers still around. Um, Columbia Pictures, Paramount, 20th Century Fox still around, but it's now been bought by Disney, which as I said is a huge conglomerate. Universal Studios, MGM United Artists, and then Disney. There are corporate independents, um, and the, these major studios also finance many of the independent films companies and control the distribution. So they're, these, the ones on top there are really the, the big bosses. I want to talk about a controversial um, independent movie production house called Miramax Films uh, for a minute. Um, you may not know the name of the company. They produce, have produced a lot of well-reviewed, kind of uh, successful art films. Um, they were founded and run by this dude, um, Harvey Weinstein. And uh, hopefully you have heard that name. Um, so, um, but they did, uh, again, produce a lot of successful films. I'm going to remember Shakespeare in Love, for which uh, Gwyneth Paltrow won an Academy Award. They also, by the way, this guy Harvey Weinstein was a very aggressive promoter of his films. They produced Pulp Fiction, the Kill Bill series. Um, She's All That is one they did. Uh, let's see if we can talk a little bit more about some of their films. Uh, they um, are not really in business anymore. Let's see, there's the filmography. Weinstein. Never Ending Story. Hugo. Children of Heaven, uh, Wrinkle in Time, Finding Neverland, which is a charming movie about the guy who wrote Peter Pan, in which Johnny Depp starred, the guy who did not do such a good job as in playing a Native American, but did do a good job playing a pirate, you know, etc., etc. Okay, so... 
Uh, this guy was a sexual predator, really bad news. Um, uh, but Miramax was one of the bigger and more successful independent film production companies. Um, Convergence. Movies are adaptations of TV shows, comic books, and video games, and books. Now, uh, movie companies also make money, so theaters make money on the popcorn. Movie companies make money on the merchandise, the toys, the shirts, the hats. Here you can see $60 billion a year for Disney selling Star Wars merchandise, Marvel merchandise, etc. Product placement is an interesting phenomenon. Um, this is where advertisers um, have their product, their package, be shown in a film. And they pay the film for that, for that right. This has been going on for quite a while. The early James Bond movies, for instance, with Sean Connery from Goldfinger, he would wear a Rolex watch, a Rolex Submariner, and, and you would see it on his wrist. They'd give you a shot of it when he came out of the water with, with his scuba gear on in one of the early James Bond movies. Um, and we'll look a little bit more at product placement in a minute. Here's an overall pie chart. I don't have a year for this, but it looked pretty recent. Disney Income Sources. This is the whole company. So they own media networks. They own ABC, okay, one of the big networks. They own a lot of cable channels. Uh, some interactive income, consumer products, this is the merchandising. There's the studio and entertainment, so this is all the films, the box office receipts, and their parks and resorts, Disney World, um, uh, Disneyland, they've got parks in China, they've got another one I think in Europe, 22% of their money. By the way, uh, I may have mentioned this earlier, that Disney does not have a reputation for treating lower level employees too well. Um, this young lady is Abigail Disney. She's a great niece of Walt Disney, the founder of the company. Um, she went on a rampage, uh, not altogether without reason, because people who work in the theme parks are very badly paid. They barely make a minimum wage, I believe. It's not a living wage, okay? that's paid and yet you have these top executives at Disney making tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars a year and she did a press release bemoaning that fact and then with COVID um, she came out and did another press uh, release and a statement being angry about um, theme park employees getting furloughed and not paid anything and uh, while executives at Disney are still getting a salary. So Disney, very, very successful company. Um, not as bad as Amazon in terms of treating workers, but not, not so great, FYI. So um, this is a quote. This is George Lucas a few years later than the earlier picture of him. The whole quote here is the money is in the action figures. <laughs> uh, for Star Wars, there was just a ton of merchandising. So the financial model for the for the for the for the movie studios is they get a cut of the ticket sales. The theater owners get some of it. The movie studios used to own all the movie uh, houses, all the screens. By the way, this was stopped by the Supreme Court, I think, back in the 30s, as being monopolistic. It's called vertical integration when you own every level of the business. So now they're owned by other companies, not by the movie studios. And they obviously get a big cut of the ticket sales, but the movie producers get a bunch too. DVD sales were bigger than they used to be, uh, are, uh, used to be bigger than they are now. Streaming rentals, okay, the deals that uh, movie companies are making with people like Netflix to have access to stream their films. Um, goes counts for something. There's some controversy here. You may have seen that um, for Disney, uh, the Black Widow film starring Scarlett Johansson was released, I believe, on streaming. It was streamed. This was on HBO. I think the deal for this particular movie was it streamed on HBO. And she was supposed to get a cut, just like the 2.5 points that Spielberg and uh, Lucas switched for Close Encounters in Star Wars, she got points 
in ticket sales, but she didn't have a piece of any kind of streaming income. And so she sued, I believe it was Disney, who she made the original deal with, asking for a piece of the streaming income, saying that she got gypped because it wasn't just in theaters. It was uh, part of the demand to see it was, 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 was people watching it at home who did not buy tickets. So she got pissed off, and they made a settlement. And so this is something that's going to be going on more and more. Uh, as some people want to stream it at home, some people want to see it in a theater, what are the financials of that? Um, merchandise and product placement. Those are the ways the studios make sales. Now here's the value of the Star Wars franchise, um, which began in 1977 when the first Star Wars was released. The total value, money it's made so far, is almost $69 billion. You see the merchandise sales, folks. <laughs> $42 billion of the $68 billion. Oh my gosh. Box office, $10 billion. Home video, $9 billion. Video games, book sales, TV revenue. Um, and um, Walt Disney Company bought Lucasfilm from George Lucas. So he's right that the action figures are where the money is. And so here's another one. I know we're looking at this a lot of different ways. Um, in fact, you know, I think... I'm going to skip this one because I think it just, maybe we don't need it. I think we, we made the point here. These are all the sources of income for people making movies. Okay. Okay. Product placement, again. Um, it's also a way, you know, ads on TV are very avoidable. You can change the channel. You can turn off the TV. You can go to the other room. Um, but if it's implanted in a... TV program or a film or an influencer talks about a product, you can't really turn turn it off. So product placement is a big business in films. Here's one of the most famous product placements of all time. This is Reese's Pieces being used by um, the boy in E.T. so he can find his way back, I think, to where he finds E.T. in the forest. And this had a huge effect on Reese's Pieces sales. And again, be conscious, whenever you see a logo <laughs> of a product, they paid for it. Um, sometimes, not so much in films, but definitely in TV shows, the writers will even have the cast talk about uh, whoever's buying the product placement and say favorable things about it. I think TGI Fridays is famous for doing that in The Office where they all talk about how happy they are to go to TGI Fridays. So that's primo product placement. You don't only, not only see the product, but they say good things about it. It's like an endorsement. So here's where we are. Um, we finished number nine. We finished the business. We're now going to talk about, I think, today and then final thoughts. So we're really almost done here. So the growing relationship between theatrical films and TV, and then the convergence of everything. Netflix. We need to talk about Netflix. Founded in 1997. Shipping movies on a DVD format in the U.S. Um, competing with Blockbuster and other uh, video rental stores. They did it all without a store. Uh, Blockbuster could have acquired them for $50 million at one point, but didn't. Um, they launched video streaming. They, f they saw the future in 2007. They did, I believe they're credited for the first streaming series when they, re they released all the episodes of House of Cards Season 1 on February 1st, 2013, and basically invented a new type of me a new medium the streaming series. Um, they now have 75 million subscribers, 155 million all over the world, and they are in over 190 countries. They account for one-third of all worldwide internet traffic at peak viewing times. Wow. They are a content creator. Um, I'm going to stop here.